And let's turn in our Bibles to Ephesians chapter 4. We're going to be looking at verses 17 through 24. Beginning here with verse 17, we read, This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk, in the futility of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God, because of the ignorance that is in them. Because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over to lewdness to work all uncleanness with greediness. But you have not so learned Christ, if indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning your former conduct the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. A lot in there. Um, but first of all, who can tell me what this picture is up here? Oh, somebody got it right the first time. What does it look like um, generally, if you're thinking biblically? Looks like the Tower of Babel. Now, this is Burning Man, the Burning Man Festival out in Nevada, where basically what takes place is at the end of the summer, uh, and I wonder if the person who knew that has been there. No. <laughs> But, but what takes place every year is you have all these people come, tens of thousands of people come out, and they're searching for meaning, and they're doing it in about every way imaginable and possible. It's quote-unquote open, no judgment, anything, do what you want, do what you feel sort of thing. It's kind of like, um, like Woodstock gone to seed. And it's interesting because this is an opportunity where dozens of ministries really go out, Christian ministries go out and witness these people because they're searching for, for truth. But it's, it really goes back, though, as we've learned in our survey of the Bible as we're going through, uh, in dealing with two things, dealing with Genesis chapter 3 when we're talking about their issue, the temptation that Satan presented to Eve was that you would be like the Most High, that you would be like God. And that's one thing we see in modern philosophy and the way it's going. It's, it's, there's this difference in philosophy. The traditional Judeo-Christian Western thought is called, could be called twoism. Where, is, where there's God and there's creation. They're separate. But in modern philosophy and much of what takes on a burning man and the philosophies that are presented there is called oneism, which means that God's in everything, you're in God, so you're God, and, you know, it becomes a whole kind of mishmash of stuff. Now... Would you be surprised? And at the end of the festival, they burn this, all this stuff. And they have the big effigy of a man they burn at the end too. But you'd be interested to know what that chapel is called. The Chapel of Babel. They actually do call it Babel because the whole thing, the whole idea is getting mankind together, getting you know, all us unified in the one sort of thing. It's like everybody wants to be a Borg or something. I don't know. But, but that's where, and it's important to realize this is where people's thought, mindset, philosophically is going today. 
this is supported much by the folks in Silicon Valley. And again, there's this whole flow there that comes from, you know, I mentioned Genesis 3, but also Genesis 11, the Tower of Babel, and what was the focus then? Let us come together, build this tower to the sky that we might, you know, not be separated, but we could come together and make a name for ourselves. And so that's, this is a continuation of Genesis. What we see taking place in our world today is a continuation. It's not, you know, people today like to think of themselves as so much smarter, so much more technologically advanced, knowing so much, but we go back to the same thing, go back to old paganism is basically what it's going back to. When you reject the truth, this is what you, this is what you end up. And this is what we're looking at today as um, where, as Paul's describing here in chapter 4 of Ephesians, continuing to talk about what it means to walk in the truth. Walk in the truth. Now, in verses... Um, 17 through 19, he first tells them, don't live like the world. That is living like the world. Anything goes, whatever feels good, do it. We're all one, you know, and all of that. There's no accountability. There's no responsibility. It's just what it is. So he's saying then, this I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk. Yet they were Gentiles, but don't live like all those other Gentiles. In the futility of their mind. Now Paul refers directly back to verses 1 through 3 of chapter 4 in his appeal to the Ephesians to walk worthy of their calling as believers. He considers it a critical matter that Christians should live differently than the world. Important to realize we're called, to, in fact, the word church, the Greek word means those called out. And we've been called out of the world to live differently than the world. On the one hand, you want to make it clear that you're no better than they are, a sinner saved by grace, as Paul said in 1 Timothy 1.15, where he said, Christ came into the world to save sinners, among whom I am chief. And that's true of each of us. We're all sinners saved by grace. On the other hand, you want to walk so that people see the difference in your life and think that you might have the answer to the emptiness and lack of meaning that they're experiencing. We have to show a difference. If we just live like everyone else, they don't see a difference. They don't see that you have anything to offer. In Matthew, chapter 5, verse 16, it says, Let your light so shine before men that they, see, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. As Paul says, he is testifying in the Lord. He's referring to um, things that a Christian should be or should do. He's speaking of a lifestyle that should be characteristic of Christians. The word walk here refers to a person's lifestyle, their manner of life, the way they're living. There's a standard of behavior that even non-Christians recognize that Christians should follow. Have you ever noticed that? They notice that. They say, you're a Christian. Well, are you living consistently with that? And it's sad when 
a believer gets rebuked by a non-believer for not living according to the expected standard. I mean, we've seen that in Genesis, when both with Abraham and Isaac, when they both at different times lied about their wives being their sisters so, so they could get along with the Gentiles in that situation. One characteristic of a believer that he describes here is that they walk in the futility of their mind. Now, what does it mean? What does futility mean? It means a waste. It means usefulness. It means worthless thinking, a worthless thinking process without a goal. Their thinking process is worthless in that it goes no place of value. It's just like circular reasoning. It's just like it goes nowhere. It goes nowhere. It's like I notice on YouTube. You ever get on YouTube? And, you know, I think there's different things come up with different movie reviews sometimes, and there'll be... There'll be a movie review maybe of a, one of the superhero movies or something, and repeatedly I see this expression on this, and this is like week after week. It'll say, talking about whatever they're going to talk about, the movies, what's going to happen with this character or whatever, and they say, and this changes everything. But they say it every time they write it. And so it's like futile. It comes, you're talking about characters that don't really exist and you're getting into all these conversations about things that don't even exist. I remember when my son was younger, he, we had some computer games. This is back when you still had to put CDs in, into, into the uh, computer to run the game. And he had these games. It was a series of games. They were called backyard, either soccer or backyard football. And I remember he would have, because you would develop and name all these characters in it, and my son would be, you know, he'd be little at the time. Now he's this big with a beard, so I don't have these same type of conversations. But he, we'd have these conversations, and he would talk about this character and what they were like and everything. And I'd look at him and say, well, Josh, you know, they don't really exist. And they'd just go, I know, I know, I know. But that's the way, the futility of the mind, you have all these people discussing things that are totally irrelevant and may not even exist. Good example today. And again, dealing with the superhero movies and things, the multiverse. It's like, give me a break. You have absolutely no evidence for this thing, but you've created it. The reason, you know, they, they came up with the whole multiverse is they realized that there's not enough time for evolution. There's not enough, not enough time has taken place for all the transitions that would be necessary for evolution to really tr take place. So what we have to do is come up with a multiverse that could be interacting with different universes so that they could impact one another. But there is absolutely no evidence for it. Futility of the mind. Futility. Now, also, a goal a person might have is worthless if it isn't established with eternity in mind. Excuse me, I had a tickle. Um, if it isn't established with eternity in mind. Ephesians, uh, going on to verse 18, we read, having their understanding standing darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart. The reason the Gentiles or unbelievers walk in the futility of their mind 
is that they continuously live in a state of being darkened. Now, spiritually speaking, darkness, obviously, you think of darkness. What is it? It's the absence of light. You don't have any light, it's dark. So, spiritually speaking, light refers to truth, The way things really are. You know, when you flip a light on, you can see things in the room for what they're really like, what they really are. Lights off, you can't see anything for what it is. You can be deceived. You can think, well, that chair I thought was over there, but it's dark and I walk and I fall over the chair because it's in a different place. As followers of Jesus, we have a way to walk and a place to walk. As it says in 1 John 2, 6, He who says he abides in him or abides in Jesus ought himself also to walk just as he walked. People are alienated from God because of their willful ignorance. Willful, willful meaning they choose their ignorance. As it says in Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 21, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness because What may be known of God is manifest to them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things which are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because although they knew God, They did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Willful ignorance really is the worst kind of ignorance. As you see here, it says they, from the Romans chapter 1, is they suppress the truth. They refused the truth, they heard it, they stuffed it. And that's the worst type of ignorance because it's self-deceiving. It's self-deceiving. The woke culture is all about willful ignorance. When you can deny clearly observable facts and say that a man can become a woman and a woman can become a man, you are willfully ignorant. There's no other way to put it. On a more personal level, we are willfully ignorant when we tell ourselves that we can be fulfilled in our lives personally without Jesus or when we can give him a lower priority in our lives than he deserves. That he just forms or functions kind of as an attachment to my life and not be my life. The word blindness here refers to a callousing over so that it would probably be better translated hardening. For the reason for man's kind, mankind's ignorance and lack of understanding of spiritual truths is the hardness of heart. Hardness of heart. The callousing, what takes place, how you develop a callous. Like if you play a guitar or an instrument like that, you're, you're developing calluses as a response to the, the pain that takes place there so that your, your 
senses then are dulled to that in that it's calloused over. When it's talking about our hearts, it's like when someone hears the gospel and they resist it. And they resist it. They've put a callous over their hearts so that it becomes easier the next time when they hear it to resist it again. And then another layer of callous grows. And then the next time, becoming more, becoming more and more calloused as they go. And then it comes to the point where not only will they not believe, but they callous themselves, they harden their hearts to the point where they cannot believe. Cannot believe. Now in verse 19 we read, Who being past feeling, again because they were calloused, have given themselves over to lewdness to work all uncleanness with greediness. Paul continues to describe the lifestyle of the Gentiles that the believing Gentiles are now to separate themselves from. In verse 18, he spoke of the reason (coughs) they are the way they are. Now he speaks of the result of this callousness. The result of such behavior. It says, having become callous to the truth, they have lost the capacity to feel shame and and embarrassment. Lost the ability to feel shame and embarrassment. They march naked in parades, flaunting their perverse alternate lifestyles. I know someone whose kids recently took them to such a parade in Washington State to see what their react, see what their parents' reaction would be. As people, yes, do just that, parade naked. And it's amazing to me that culturally we're in a, at a point now where that's permissible. Where that's permissible. Where that's, you know, accepted without any form of legal action. In Romans chapter 13, verses 12 through 14, we read, The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ. And make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lust. Now, when it speaks of lewdness here in this passage, it refers to undisciplined behavior. Yes, it includes sexual behavior, but it's generally undisciplined, unrestrained behavior. It's to remove all constraints, as they do at Burning Man. They are continually caught up in every type of self-gratifying behavior, but never finding satisfaction in it. It's like whatever this next extreme is. I mean, we see over... You remember back in the 80s when there was the, the heavy push for gay rights and equality there in that, you know, what they called the equality... Did it stop there? No. Now we get to further and further into into confusion. We get to now we have transsexuality, and now and then we get to the point now where what's even being promoted is pedophilia. Pedophilia. You know, just the next thing, the next thing, the next thing. And you think, what's going to be after that? Well, I read once that this lady in England wanted to marry her chandelier. 
where do you draw the line? You see, apart from Christ, apart from a relationship with him, there is no line. This was me. This was you before we came to know Christ. You'll never be fulfilled trying to satisfy yourselves in ways other than God intended. Never. It just won't happen. You'll never be satisfied because you were created to have a relationship with him and nothing else will satisfy you. Nothing else. Where do you find fulfillment in your life? That's the question we need to ask ourselves. Where do we find fulfillment? If we seek to find fulfillment in anything other than a relationship with God through Christ, it will come up short. I think of kids that, are, that play football when they're really young. What's everybody's goal? They're going to be a professional football player. How many of them make it? Extremely low percentage make it to professional football. But if their whole life was wrapped up in that, where do you go? And you just end up switching from one meaning, you know, one source of meaning or purpose to another, never finding any satisfaction. Because none of those things will last forever. The only thing that will last forever is a relationship with Jesus. Now we see in verses 20 through 21 that we are told then to walk in the truth. As it says in verse 20, but you have not so learned Christ. Comparing him to the way the world thinks, the way the world lives, the way it, it all being futile, all being in futility, just coming up with whatever, whatever's the next thing in doing it. So Paul draws a strong contrast between the worldview of the world and that of the believer. The difference is first the way that they learned him or learned of him. It wasn't a matter of just trying to gratify yourself, not just trying to, you know, this is what really the world tries to attack. And even at Burning Man is that they pretty much all the time have some set up there where they're directly attacking Jesus. Always. And there's a reason for that. Because as the scripture says, we haven't, I believe it's Peter who said, we don't follow cunningly devised fables when we proclaim to you really who Jesus is. You know, we, we have historical evidence. We have textual evidence. We have evidence for what we believe. We just don't believe some random thing that, well, it doesn't matter what you believe. You can believe the moon is green cheese if you want. And if you go to burning men, they'll be fine with that. But it's not real. It's not the way things are. We know, as Paul said, I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him until that day. The scripture repeatedly say, says that, you know, that with many infallible proofs, he proved the resurrection. He rose from the dead. And over 500 people saw him. Evil, easily evidenced. Now, 
as it says, well, it wasn't a matter, again, of just trying to gratify yourself in some way. It more likely your searching started from a profound sense of emptiness that was satisfied only with a real relationship with Jesus. As it says in Colossians 2, verses 6 through 7, as you therefore have received Christ Jesus, the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. Part of the great apostasy that's taking place is this whole trying to re-image Jesus into one that's acceptable to the whole globalist uh, agenda and perspective, but not satisfying the lost soul, not satisfying, not really connecting to who he actually is. Verse 21, we read, If indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus. Now, the word translated, if indeed, carries more really of the meaning of since indeed. He's not questioning what's taking place in their lives, but he's making a confident assumption based upon them having learned Christ, coming to know Christ. Now, it's important because as he's as we've talked about in the past couple of weeks, when he's talking about knowing him, he uses an intensified word, which really means to really know him by experience. You've experienced the Lord. You've come face to face with Christ and the claims of Christ. That's what it's talking about. It's not talking about just some random speculating but knowing him, being face to face with him. He is saying that they heard him with understanding. This is their initial hearing of the gospel from the heart. As it says in Revelation 3.20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock, and if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I'll come into him and dine with him and he with me. Once you open the door, there is a continuing teaching that takes place in him. Continue to learn of him. As Charles Spurgeon wrote, so if you want to know the Lord Jesus Christ, you must live with him. First, he must himself speak to you. And afterwards, you must abide in him. He must be the choice companion of your morning hours. He must be with you throughout the day. And with him, you must also close the night. And as often as you may wake during the night, you must say, when I awake, I am still with thee. You only grow in your knowledge of Jesus as you walk with him, as you walk with him. And what I mean by walking with him is as you have fellowship with him through the day, as situations come up, are you taking them to him in prayer? When you're reading the Bible, are the things that you're reading, are they standing out to you? Are you taking them and applying them to your lives by the power of the Holy Spirit? Are you walking in him? You're walking in him. Now, in verses 22 through 24, we see that not only 
are we to walk in the truth, but we are also to walk out the truth. Verse 22, and put off concerning your former conduct the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts. Truth really only impacts us when we take it and apply it. We grow in our relationship with the Lord, being taught by him through the process of putting off and putting on. As you're walking with the Lord, again, being in his word, and he's showing you things, things coming to your attention, you make a conscious decision that by his strength, by the power of his Holy Spirit, you'll lay a things aside those things that are contrary to his nature, and you'll take on those things that are Christ-like. As it says in Colossians 3, 8 through 10, but now you yourselves are to put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. Do not lie to one another since you have put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man who is renewed in the knowledge in knowledge according to the image of him who created him the old man refers to the old nature before you came to know Christ how you were before the old man the can be referred to as in you know in our part adam the old the first man fallen Unabated, that old nature continues to become more and more corrupt. And we see in this in society, as the culture gets further and further from the Judeo Christian ethic and becomes more and more pagan and decadent. I mean, in the necessity of putting off and putting on, you can see it with, with clothing, obviously. I mean, as far as putting off goes, I don't know about, well, I, I like jeans. I like wearing jeans. I like when they get comfortable. Uh, but you get much beyond comfortable, they start to get holes. They start to get holes even in embarrassing places. Like the back pocket always seems to tear, and you can't, you know, I can't go. Those jeans are still really comfortable, but I can't wear them around because they got a big hole in the back. So I have to put off those old jeans and put on a pair of new ones because they are just continuing. I can be sure, you know, the law of entropy is taking place even with my jeans that everything's decaying and becoming more simple. So I put that thing off and I have to put on a new pair of jeans. The same way the old man who is corrupting, being corrupted, as we see manifested in this behavior, as we see manifested in Genesis chapter 3 and Genesis chapter 11, as we see that we put off that and put on the new man, that is, as it says, in the image of Christ. Now, they deceive us the world and these things deceive us to believe that we can be satisfied with such things. Now, in verse 23, we read, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. 
as we are involved in the process of putting off and putting on, God is involved in renewing our minds by the Holy Spirit. As it says in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Putting off, putting on. In Ephesians 3.16 Paul prayed for the Ephesians there that he, referring to God, would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man. You cannot live the Christian life in your own strength, nor were you ever intended to. It's a constant depending upon the Holy Spirit. We either walk, are walking in the spirit or we're walking in the flesh. They are mutually exclusive, diametrically opposed to each other. You can't do both of them at the same time. You can't be walking in the spirit, depending on the Lord by the Holy Spirit, and walking in your own strength at the same time. Can't do it. They're going in two different directions. And that's what people misunderstand very often when they try to live the Christian life in their own strength. Because what you're actually doing when you do that is feeding the old nature. You're feeding the flesh because you're depending on your own strength and not walking in the Spirit. Now, in verse 24, we read, and that you put on the new man which is created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Putting on the new man means to take on the characteristics, the virtues, the intentions, the motivations of someone who has been born again. What does a born again person look like? As it says in Colossians 3, 12, and 13, Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another and forgiving one another, if anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. Putting on the Lord Jesus Christ. The standard to which the new man is created, it says, he said is created according to God. That takes us back, that picture takes us back to Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and 27, when it talks about how man was created in the image of God. It says, in the image of God, in the image of God, God created man, male and female, he created them. But the picture is where you're created in him's image and likeness. And we're to be conformed then into his image. The image is reflected in us, his image is reflected us in us in two ways. The first, as he says here, is according to true righteousness or in true righteousness. That righteousness, as it speaks of here, has, it deals with our relations with other people, acting righteously towards other people. When it speaks of true holiness, it speaks of our conduct before, before God, our relationship with God. We're walking in a right relationship with other people on the horizontal level, and we're walking rightly with God on the vertical level. So there are really two paths which a person can take. 
you are either taking the path of self-will leading really to paganism and destruction or you're walking in the light of a relationship with Jesus that progressively draws you closer to him. Those are the choices, the only two. Do not allow the world to squeeze you into its mold. It's trying so hard to do it. These days, as we see even persecution of the church rising in different situations, they are trying to get you to go along with their program. But walk in the truth that's only found in Jesus. Walk out that truth daily as you apply it to the circumstances of your life. And the cool thing about that is you're not walking alone. You're never walking alone. Because the Lord is with you every step of the way. Every step of the way. When Paul was in Corinth and, you know, a lot of crazy stuff was going on, it says the Lord appeared to him and said, you know, don't fear, Paul. Nobody's going to harm you, and I have many people in this place. So, you know, repeatedly, the Lord appeared, or the Lord comforted somebody's heart, as he will do for us. He will reveal himself to us as we walk in him, as we trust in him. So, I would encourage you to ask yourself the question, How am I walking? Am I walking as a new, the new person in Christ that I am, if you have been born again? Am I being conformed into the image of Christ, becoming more like Jesus day to day as I put off the old man to going through that process, putting on the new man? Or am I just going the way of the world? That's the choice. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your word. But Lord, just knowing the incredible comfort we have in you, strength we have in you by your spirit. Lord, just knowing you are working these things out in our lives. And you've even put us in these times, these crazy times in which we're living for such a time as this, Lord. And you've called us who you've called to be, who you've called us to be here, salt and light. So we pray that you use each of us in our various situations, Lord God, to glorify the name of Jesus. We thank you for that, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.